Good afternoon, everyone. We've got a punctual bunch today. Welcome to this month's compliance webinar. Um, this month, we're looking at trainers and assessors. So that's RTO clauses 1.13 through to 1.20 and overseas student transfers. So that's CRICOS standards 7.1 through to 7.7. .7. And I'll be kicking off and Angela will be joining us a bit later and I'll be handing over to her when she gets here. So in your continuous improvement cycle, as I'm sure you're aware, we're in April. Um, so the clauses that I just mentioned are what we're covering. And as usual, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and I'll answer them throughout the session. Um, when you do so, if you're happy for other people to see your questions, if you change the, um, the drop down selection, the to selection to say all panelists and attendees, so everyone else can see what you've asked. If you're not comfortable doing that, then happy for you to keep it, keep it as all panelists. Um, this webinar forms part of your continuous improvement cycle, um, which relates to clause 2.2. Following the webinar, we recommend that you hold a quality and compliance meeting and include in your minutes that you attended this webinar. You should also review your policies and procedures um, for quality and compliance meetings to ensure that you're addressing um, all of the agenda items that you should be addressing and that you review the policies and procedures that relate to this topic. So trainers and assessors, and if you're CRICOS, um, then the student transfer processes. That includes all documentation, not just the policies and procedures. So any forms that relate to those things. Let's get into it. So clauses. 1.13 to 1.16 trainers and assessors. So the clauses state 1.13 that in addition to the requirements specified in clause 1.14 and clause 1.15, the RTO's training and assessment is delivered by persons who have a vocational competencies at least to the level being delivered and assessed. B current industry skills directly relevant to the training and assessment being provided and c current knowledge and skills in vocational training learning uh, and learning that informs their training and assessment 1.14 states that the rto's training and assessment is delivered by only by persons who have we'll just jump to b because a is no longer relevant um, the training and assessment qualifications specified in item one or item two of schedule one. We'll go through what they are shortly. Clause 1.15 states that where a person conducts assessment only, the RTO ensures that that person has B, item one or item two or item three of schedule one. And 1.16 states that the RTO ensures that all trainers and assessors undertake professional development in the fields of knowledge and practice of vocational training, learning and assessment, including competency based training and assessment. So in brief, what that means is that your trainers and assessors hold the required credentials in terms of training and assessment. So that is um, either the TAE 40116 Certificate for in Training and Assessment um, or TAE 40110 Certificate for in Training and Assessment plus uh, Design and Develop Assessment Tools and Address Adult Language Literacy and Numeracy Skills. For assessors only, that means that they 
hold um, one of the following skill sets, either the TAE SS00011 assessor skill set or its successor, or um, the assessor skill set, the previous assessor skill set, which is quadruple zero one, plus one of the following design and develop assessment tool units. So either the TAE ASS 502A, TAE ASS 502B, or the TAE ASS 502. or one of those certificate for in training and assessment or higher level qualification in adult education. And in terms of a higher level of qualification in adult education, that could include an associate degree of vocational education and training, a bachelor of adult and vocational education, a graduate diploma in adult and vocational education and training, a graduate diploma of adult language literacy and numeracy, a Master of Education degree with an adult education focus, or a CA, CASR Part 61 flight or simulator instructor license, or be an Army recruit instructor. Um, the next requirement, so from 1.13a, is that they hold vocational competencies at least to level being delivered and assessed going to that a bit further. So that can be either through holding the same units or demonstrating equivalency of the units that they're delivering. 1.13b basically says that they have, your trainers and assessors have current industry skills directly relevant to what they're delivering, the training and assessment being provided. 1.13c in brief requires that they have current knowledge and skills in vocational training and learning that informs their training and assessment. And 1.16 requires that they undertake relevant professional development. Okay, so what is current industry skills and knowledge? What does it look like? How can it be demonstrated? Usually a staff matrix <clears throat> will be able to demonstrate how that your trainer assessor has current industry skills and knowledge <clears throat> and how their past experience relates to the units that they're delivering. It should include mapping of their current industry skills within the last three years against each unit of competency that they're delivering. It must relate directly to the training and assessment being provided. And it needs to be a minimum of three years industry experience within the last six to 12 months. Um, so for example, if you have a trainer who's delivering CHC ECE 005, provide care for babies and toddlers, the trainer assessor should have a minimum of three years experience in caring for babies and toddlers. Um, this is being employed within a regulated childcare facility within the last six to 12 months. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we've seen some variance in that at audit. So that's why we've got that range of six to 12 months. Majority of auditors are satisfied with um, currency being for within the last 12 months. But every now and again, we come across an auditor who expects to see the currencies demonstrated within the last six months. In addition to it being mapped um, in the trainer matrix, it's always good to have supporting evidence that demonstrates that what's stated in the trainer matrix is, is correct. Um, so that can be uh, reference letters from employers, evidence if it's um, uh, like project management or something that, that results in a deliverable evidence of the deliverable that they've um, uh, that they've completed as part of a previous work role, something that demonstrates that what they say is actually what they have done. So how do you keep your evidence? How do you store evidence and what evidence is appropriate? So for each trainer assessor, 
you must have sufficient evidence to show that they demonstrate appropriate competency, currency and professional development. All information presented by trainers and assessors is to be verified. This may include contacting the provider names on a person's evidence, including qualifications to confirm the documentation is genuine. So that can be RTOs that if, have issued certificates or it can be past employers. Conducting referee checks at the time of employment to confirm relevant industry experience. Um, evidence demonstrating that verification has been conducted should be stored on the trainer's file. <clears throat> and you should also do this on an ongoing capacity, not just once, not just when you're employing the trainer, but at least every 12 months. Have a system in place for going back and checking, confirming that you have current information about your trainer assessor, that if they need an updated reference letter, that you ask your trainer assessor to, to collect that. And if you hire assessors only, um, that they do not deliver training and they must hold at least the assessor skill set as listed on the on the screen. Or one of the required TAEs or higher qualification in adult education. Okay. So and Another way of verifying trainers' suitability is you can verify their qualifications um, on training.gov. So looking up the RTO that issued a qualification and confirming that they had that qualification listed on their scope of registration at the time it was issued to your trainer assessor. Um, you could download a or request your trainer to download a, an authenticated VET transcript from the USI registrar, um, contacting referees and RTOs that issued qualifications and asking for verification. Usually it's best if you can do that in writing, it creates um, stronger evidence than if you were doing it over the phone and, and writing who you'd spoken to. Cite original certificates and attain certified copies for your HR records. Check websites of training or PD organisation. So confirming that they are actually offering that particular type of training that your, RTO, your trainer assessor has enrolled in or completed. Calling an association or network that your trainer assessor says they're connected with. And you are verifying by doing that their qualifications and certificates, their experience in both VET and vocation. Um, you can also obtain copies of their resume, previous position descriptions and references. Um, and in terms of professional development, evidence of workshops, conferences, webinars that are either accredited or non-accredited or both. And evidence from associations and networks such as a membership certificate or an email confirming um, that they're a member. So vocational competency, so this goes back to our 1.13a. Vocational competency means that trainers have the particular skills and knowledge relevant to the industry area in which they are delivering. The training product identifies the competencies that the relevant industry requires. No questions yet. And that is demonstrated through holding the competency they're delivering or demonstrating equivalence of competency. That would be done in the trainer matrix, mapping out their experience to each of the units that they're delivering that they do not hold. So that's mapping the skills and knowledge. 
So in the trainer matrix, documenting all skills and knowledge requirements for each unit of competency or module the trainer assessor is delivering, collecting evidence of the trainer and assessor's vocational competencies, verifying that evidence they have provided and creating a record of the analysis between the evidence and the competency requirements. Really digging deep. If your trainer assessor doesn't hold the units, it almost becomes a bit of an RPO process. What evidence can you collect? Verifiable evidence can you collect that shows that your trainer assessor meets the requirements of a unit that they don't hold the qualification of that same unit for? Meeting current industry requirements. Here we go. We have a question and there's no such thing as a silly question. Um, okay, so a very good question asking if you're adding a new course to scope, something that's a new area. Um, and the trainers assessors are working through a train the trainer course because it's a very brand new area and there is minimal prior experience. How do you demonstrate the skills and knowledge requirements? That is a fantastic question. Um, so you'd be using that train the training course you've done to demonstrate that you do have the skills and knowledge and if possible applying that in the workplace or practicing those skills in a more in-depth level so that you can demonstrate that you've got more experience to that than just having done the train the trainer course. Um, let me know if that doesn't answer your question or if you'd like more information. Meeting current industry skill requirements. Um, so it needs to be consistent with the requirements of the training package or accredited courses that are being delivered. Um, need to be consistent with the required skills for trainers and assessors that your RTO has identified through industry engagement. That's a, another option for you there too is um, when you do your um, industry consultation surveys, asking, asking the industry what they think the minimum level of experience of a trainer assessor is in that area. And it might be that they say because it's a new area, no one's got that depth of experience and they recommend um, that having done a train the trainer course in the area is sufficient. Okay, in terms of current knowledge and skills in vocational training and learning, so this is your clause 1.13c, that trainers and assessors have contemporary knowledge of the vocational education and training environment. So that is delivery of training and conducting assessment. They can demonstrate this knowledge when delivering training and assessment and training and assessment that they deliver is relevant to the learner's needs. So keeping your trainers and assessors up to date and the latest methodologies for delivery, how to transfer their, their knowledge onto the students and how to um, assess students using current practices. Now, professional development. Professional development is an interesting one, clause 1.16, because the clause actually states that the RTO is responsible. So you as, as RTO, looking who's here, as RTO managers are responsible for ensuring that your trainers and assessors are undertaking professional development, whether that's joining VetNet works, attending workshops and or conferences, um, updating their qualifications, undertaking work experience, well that more relates to currency, um, participating in um, annual performance re reviews to ensure that they're planning their PD and that they're meeting their PD requirements. Um, vivacity memberships are a good way to um, keep your PD requirements or your trans assessors PD requirements up to date developing PD plans at least once a year, having a PD schedule that's updated by the trainer assessor to reflect the activities that they've undertaken 
for the past period. Usually it's a, an annual cycle. We do see some RTOs that do it as a quarterly review cycle. Have you done what you said you'd do in the last quarter for PD? Or is something further needed to be arranged? Rather than getting to that 12 month mark and realizing, uh oh, our trainers assessors haven't done their PD and it's been a good 12 months since they've done anything and now we need to rush around and get something sorted. Um, professional development doesn't need to be external. It can be something that's arranged internally. You could have quarterly or monthly um, train the trainer sessions conducted by your RTO manager or um, you can have an outside person like Angela come in and deliver specific training to your RTO, your trainers assessors. Okay, and then the next group of clauses are 1.17 to 1.20 that relate to individuals working under the supervision of a trainer. So the clauses say 1.17 that where the RTO in delivering training, training and assessment engages an individual who is not a trainer assessor, the individual works under the supervision of a trainer or assessor and does not determine assessment outcomes. The RTO ensures an individual working under the supervision of a trainer um, under clause 1.17 holds the skill set defined in item six of schedule one, which is either um, TAESS 00007 Enterprise Trainer Presenting Skill Set or TAESS 00014 Enterprise Trainer Presenting Skill Set or TAESS 00008 Enterprise Trainer Mentoring Skill Set. TAESS 00013 Enterprise Trainer Mentoring Skill Set or TAESS quadruple zero three Enterprise Trainer and Assessor Skill Set or lastly TAESS 00015 Enterprise Trainer and Assessor Skill Set. So they must hold one of those skill sets and have the vocational competencies at least to the level being delivered and assessed like we discussed earlier with your trainers assessors and have current industry skills directly relevant to the training and assessment being provided. Clause 1.19 states that where the RTO engages an individual under clause 1.17 it ensures that the training and assessment complies with standard one. So basically that you they follow your training and assessment strategies and your session plans. They use the resources that you provide to them or that are, are listed in your session plans or um, TASs. And 1.20, without limiting clauses 1.17 to 1.19, the RTO must A, determine and put in place the level of supervision required and any requirements, conditions or restrictions considered necessary on the individual's involvement in the provision of training and collection of assessment evidence. And B, ensures the trainers providing the supervision monitoring um, and are accountable for all training provision and collection of assessment evidence by the individual under their supervision. So in brief 1.17, under supervision, that means individuals engaged by the RTO who aren't trainers and assessors, um, who don't hold a TAE, cannot determine assessment outcomes. These might be new trainers that haven't finished their TAE yet or um, aren't sure if they're gonna continue down the trainer career. So I don't want to spend six months completing their TAE. They could be guest speakers or they could be assistant trainers. 
Um, they are not. So recently in ASQA's spotlight on training, ASQA has clarified that workplace supervisors are not considered to be trainers under supervision. So they've cleared up a grey area for us. One point one eight supervising trainers. If you have a trainer assessor who is supervising someone who is not qualified, the supervisor should meet the requirements of clauses one point one three, one point one four, and one point one six as specified earlier. So what we discussed earlier of um, vocational competence, industry currency, um, currency with vocational education and training holding a certificate for and training and assessment um, or high level qualification and undertake regular professional development. One point one nine training and assessment complies. So I mentioned earlier that all training um, that's conducted under supervision is in accordance with your TASs, your, ses your session plans, your DAPs, using the resources that you specify and provide to them. 1. And for 1.20, having policies and procedures for managing supervision. You must have, if you have trainers assessors under supervision, you must have policies and procedures in place for managing supervision. This includes the level of supervision or if you're a larger RTO, having different levels of supervision depending on the experience, um, knowledge and skills of your people under supervision, how you will manage the supervision. So supervisors, Um, what are the conditions for supervision and how the RTO will ensure that the individual under supervision is monitored? How often will you catch up with the, with the supervisor and the person under supervision? Is the supervisor perfectly capable to 100% um, monitor the person under supervision without input from management? Will there be weekly meetings? Will there be monthly meetings? Will the supervisor sit in on classes? Um, or direct supervise, or will there be indirect supervision where the person under supervision is just reporting back to their supervisor about how they're going. Um, you also need to specify how the RTO will ensure that the evidence collected by people under supervision will be reviewed by a suitably qualified and experienced trainer and assessor. So that includes assessment evidence. If they're collecting assessment evidence, not making the assessment decision, but collecting assessment evidence, how that gets submitted through to the supervisor or someone qualified to make that assessment decision. Um, assessment outcomes will not be signed off by someone under supervision. Trainers assessors who are supervising are accountable for training provided and evidence collected. Uh, aside from your policies and procedures, you may have a supervision plan in place for each individual under supervision. Um, that way you can clearly specify the supervision arrangements for that individual. Um, for smaller RTOs, that's normally an appropriate way to manage trainers, assess, the trainers that you have under supervision. Specifying who it is they report to, how regularly they report, um, what date the supervision commences, how long the supervision is going to be in place for, whether it's until they receive their um, certificate for in training as an assessment or it's uh, a longer term, more permanent arrangement, specifying that all in place and having everybody agree and sign off that that's what they're agreeing to. Okay, so we're almost at the, I talk much faster than Angela and <laughs> don't make them stretch out quite as long. So we're almost at the end. So just a quick update on what's happening um, with the VET reform. 
unless there are any questions about trainers and assessors, I might give you a few moments to post any questions you have about trainers and assessors before I give you um, some information about what's happening with the VET reform. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions coming through. If you do have questions um, that come to mind after the session, um, you can always call us or email support at vivacity.com.au and someone will be able to answer your question. So in terms of the reform, um, our QI, our beloved QI learner and employer questionnaires are being phased out. I'm sure it's very exciting for all of you. They've been in place for a very long time. So there's a new system being trialled um, by select RTOs uh, with the planned new system to be administered by NCVER. So at some point in the future, once they've completed their trials and they roll out the system to all RTOs, you will, after that point, not be required to issue employer and learner questionnaires anymore. in terms of the, um, the heads of agreement for the skills reform, there have been a couple of slight changes there. Um, and the governments, the, all the state governments and the federal government are working towards a new national skills agreement. Um, I think the previous one wasn't signed by all states, the one towards the end of last year. Um, so they're expecting this new version of the national skills agreement to be signed by all states and the Commonwealth by August 2021. So their priorities in this new version are adopting a new funding model which improves funding consistency for students and integrates subsidies and loans with efficient pricing and the skills needed by employers as informed by the National Skills Commission. So, yeah, there's a question, what about this year's QI reporting? Unless you're being specially selected, your RTO, if your RTO has not been contacted, your reporting is as per usual by the 30th of June, you're required to submit your, um, your summary of your QI data collected through those surveys. Um, so the priorities, um, next priority is achieving greater consistency for fees and subsidies based on efficient prices and analysis of the public and private benefits of VET courses to simplify the system and improve fairness and consistency. Increasing the VET investment and supporting a viable and robust VET market that ensures quality and student choice. Enhancing transparency and accountability through clear roles and responsibilities for government and industry and improving the timeliness and quality of data collection. Increasing access to foundation skills to promote, promote lifelong learning and ensure more Australians have access to skills to take on employment. Embedding micro credentialing in, credentials in the training system by funded oh, by funding a reasonable mix of short courses and full qualifications. Harmonising and modernising apprenticeships to improve labour mobility and make it easier for business to take on an apprentice, knowing their training is a fit for purpose. Improving the quality of VET in schools, including the development and implementation of a national VET in, skills, in schools strategy. Promoting and supporting the National Careers Institute as the primary vehicle for careers information. Um, and as I stated, so it's due to be finalised and signed by all parties um, by August 2021, uh, with the transition period commencing 
from 1st of January 2022. Okay, also as part of the reform, there's one more survey that's open that you might like to participate in. Um, so it's sharing good practice stories. The government has asked if you can submit your stories of good practice, what has worked well in your RTO or RTOs that you've worked with. So that's available on the employment.gov.au um, website. And if Kira could kindly put the link in for me, that's in the notes section for this slide. So that's slide 21. And if there are no further questions, this is the end of the standards for RTO section of the webinar. And we are moving into the CRICOS requirements. So if you are not a CRICOS RTO, you may log off if you wish. If you'd like to hear about CRICOS requirements for transferring students, then feel free to stay with me. And Kira has put the link in the chat for everybody. Okay, into CRICOS. So standard 7.1 states that registered providers must not knowingly enroll an overseas student seeking to transfer from another registered providers course prior to the overseas student completing six months of his or her principal course. Or if you're in the school sector, which none of our clients are, until after the first six months of the first registered school sector course, except where any of the following apply. 7.1.1, the releasing registered provider um, or the course in which the overseas student is enrolled has ceased to be registered, so you can't deliver that course anymore. 7.1.2, the releasing registered provider has had a sanction imposed on its registration by the ESOS agency that prevents the OC student from continuing his or her course at that registered provider. So in the VET sector, um, the ESOS agency is ASQA. 7.1.3, the releasing registered provider has agreed to the overseas student's release and recorded the date of effect and reason for release from PRISM, uh, on PRISMs, in PRISMs, third time lucky. 7.1.4, any government sponsor of the overseas student considers the change to be in the overseas student's best interest and has provided written support for the change. Okay, transferring a student. So in summary, a registered provider must not knowingly enroll an overseas student wishing to transfer from another provider prior to the student completing six months of their principal course of study, except in cer certain circumstances. And the principal course of study is generally the final course of study covered by the overseas student's visa um, and transfer requirements apply to all courses of study prior to the student's principal course. Okay, conditions for transferring prior to the six months. So for an overseas student to transfer between complete, before completing the six months of their principal course, the overseas student must either obtain a release from their registered provider or meet one of the following conditions. The releasing provider or the course in which the student enrolled has ceased to be registered. 
so that course no longer exists, the student can't undertake the course because it's been superseded or deleted from the National Register. The releasing registered provider has had a sanction imposed on its registration by the ESOS agency that prevents the overseas student from continuing their course with that registered provider. So ASQA or another ESOS agency has suspended that course or applied some other form of sanction or cancellation to the provider so they can no longer deliver that training or any government sponsor of the overseas student considers the change to be in the overseas student's best interest and has provided written support for the change. Um, this usually applies where the overseas student study in Australia is sponsored by the government of another country. So that's not something we see very often. Okay, and for our clients using our documents, um, there's a change of enrollment form or a series of forms, change of enrollment application form, an acknowledgement letter, the outcome accepted letter, the outcome rejected letter, a refund request form, the refund request letter if a refund's approved, change of enrollment, um, refund request acknowledgement letter, change of enrollment, refund request outcome, change of enrollment suspension letter, or the letter of release um, student transfer acknowledgement. So if you're using our documents, I recommend you snip that because these will be the documents that you're reviewing as part of your Q&C meeting when you go through and check the policies and procedures and forms for these clauses or these standards. I'll give you a moment to skip it. Save you having to write out the list. Okay. Standard 7.2. For the purposes of standard 7.1.3, the registered provider must have an implemented documented policy and process for assessing overseas student transfer requests, requests prior to the overseas student completing six months of their principal course. Um, I'll skim over the school sector. The policy must be made available to staff and overseas students and outline 7.2.1, the steps for an overseas student to lodge a written request to transfer, including that they must provide a valid enrollment offer from another registered provider. 7.2.2, the circumstances in which the registered provider will grant the transfer request because the transfer is in the overseas student's best interest, including but not limited to where the registered provider has assessed that 7.2.2.1, the OEC student will be reported because they are unable to achieve satisfactory course progress at the level they are studying, even after engaging with that registered provider's intervention strategy to assist the OEC student in accordance with standard eight. So that means they can transfer to you if they're transferring into a lower level course because they will not be able to meet their course progress requirements at a higher level course that they're currently enrolled in. So for example, if they're enrolled in Diploma of Hospitality Management and they're finding it a real struggle, they might transfer to another RTO and do Certificate 3 in Hospitality or Certificate 3 in Commercial Cookery to build up um, a better foundation before um, getting to the diploma level. Processing a transfer request. When considering a request from an overseas student seeking to transfer, register providers must have and implement a documented policy and process for assessing overseas student transfer requests during the restriction period. So during that six month, first six months in their principal course. 
outline in their policy the circumstances where transfers will be granted or refused. Record all transfer request outcomes in um, PRISMS. Um, there's also a how-to guide available so that you can um, lodge those correctly through PRISMS. I know ASQA can get a bit touchy if, if not all details have been logged into PRISMS correctly. Um, not finalise a refusal to release the overseas student until the student has had an opportunity to access the complaints and appeals process and ensure whether the request concerns an overseas student under the age of 18, the overseas student parent or legal guardian has provided support for the transfer in writing. Standard 7.2, um, so 7.2.2, circumstances in which the registered provider will grant the transfer request because the transfer is in the student's best interest, including but not limited to where the registered provider has assessed that. The OC student will be reported because they are unable to achieve satisfactory court progress at the level they are studying, even after engaging with that registered provider's intervention strategy to assist the overseas student in accordance with Standard 8. There is evidence of compassionate or compelling circumstances. Um, that can be very varied as to what is compassionate and compelling. It might be that their partner's in Australia but is in another state. Um, it might be that another very close family member has, has come to Australia and is in a different location. They want to be closer to that person. Um, it might be that a family member or a very close friend in another location has got sick and needs someone to care for them and they would like to go and assist. 7.2.2.3. The registered provider fails to deliver the course as outlined in the written agreement. There is evidence that the overseas student reasonable expectations about their current course are not being met. There is evidence that the overseas student was misled by the registered provider or an education or migration agent regarding the registered provider or its course and the course is therefore unsuitable to their needs and or study objectives. 7.2.2.6, an appeal, either internal or external, on another matter results in a decision or recommendation to release the overseas student. 7.2.3, the circumstances which the registered provider considers as reasonable grounds to refuse the transfer. Um, so this is you need to have a policy and process for dealing with. Um, a reasonable time frame for assessing and replying to the overseas student's transfer request having regard to the restriction period. Okay, so in brief, your policy and process for assessing overseas student transfer requests. Um, uh, you need to have a policy for assessing an overseas student transfer request and it must be available to all staff and overseas student and outline the steps for an overseas student to lodge a written request to transfer, including that the overseas student must have a letter of offer from another registered provider. Um, the circumstances in which you'll grant the transfer request because it's in their best interest in interests or one of those circumstances that we identified before on 7.2.1 to 6. So these ones, compassionate or compelling, unable to make course progress, um, not in line with the written agreement, uh, didn't meet the student's reasonable expectation, they were misled by the agent or the um, training organisation or the appeal resulted that in that being the best decision in the decision that's best for the student. Um, must also outline the circumstances 
which the registered provider considers to be reasonable grounds to refuse the transfer request. And a reasonable time frame for assessing and replying to the overseas student's transfer request. So what are compassionate and compelling circumstances? So generally those beyond the control of the overseas student and which have an impact upon the overseas student progress or well-being are considered to be compassionate or compelling. This could include, but not limited to, serious illness or injury. Um, so the evidence for that would be a medi medical certificate stating that the overseas student um, was unable to attend. Bereavement of close family members, such as parents or guardians. Um, where possible, a death certificate should be provided to evidence that. <clears throat> but they can be quite slow to come in Australia. I don't know about overseas, but I know in Australia they take a while to um, be prepared. It may be due to major political upheaval or natural disaster in the home country requiring emergency travel that has impacted on their studies or a traumatic experience, which could include involvement in or witnessing a serious accident or witnessing or being the victim of a serious crime. And this has impacted the overseas student. Um, and these instances, you would gather evidence such as police reports or psychologist reports. Where the registered provider was unable to offer a prerequisite unit or the OC student has failed a prerequisite unit and therefore faces a shortage of relevant units for which they are eligible to enrol or inability to begin studying on the course commencement date due to a delay in receiving a student visa. No questions as yet from our Krakos people. Um, other circumstances in which a transfer could be granted. So if the registered provider has failed um, to deliver the course outlined in the written agreement. So maybe their trainer assessor quit and they couldn't deliver it. There is evidence that the overseas students' reasonable expectations about their current course are not being met, such as correspondence between the overseas student and the registered provider, or marketing materials given to the overseas student prior to enrolment, um, and setting particular expectations about the course. So it might be that the marketing material had said that the training and assessment would be delivered on a Saturday and Sunday, the students got to, to Australia, they've started their course and they've realised that it's on a Monday and a Tuesday and that doesn't work for the student. Um, there is evidence that the overseas student was misled by the registered provider or an education agent or migration agent regarding the registered provider or its course and the course is therefore unsuitable to their needs and or study objectives. An appeal internal or external on other matters results in a decision or recommendation to release the overseas student. So that might be through the overseas student ombudsman. There might have been some form of, of um, dispute and it's been agreed by all parties that to settle the matter um, will issue a letter of release and the student can transfer to another RTO. Transfer requests and packaged courses. If a transfer will affect the start date of any subsequent courses covered by the visa, the overseas student must be released from those courses or gain the subsequent registered providers agreement to delay the start of those courses. Registered providers should advise overseas students that changes to their preliminary course may have ramifications for the admission to their principal course. For example, if a preliminary course is a prerequisite entry requirement to the principal course. Thank 
Okay, standard 7.3. Additionally, if the student is under 18 years of age, the registered provider must have written confirmation from the overseas student's parent or legal guardian that supports the transfer. And where the overseas student is not being cared for in Australia by a parent or suitable nominated relative, the receiving provider must confirm and accepts responsibility for approving the student's accommodation, support and general welfare arrangements in accordance with standard five, which relates to younger overseas students. Um, so basically, if your students are under 18, um, you need written confirmation from the parent or legal guardian that's in Australia. If they don't have a parent or legal guardian in Australia, um, then it needs to be confirmed that um, the receiving registered provider will look after the accommodation and welfare arrangements for that student. And it's the responsibility of the receiving provider to ensure there are no gaps in welfare arrangements. This may include agreeing to accept welfare responsibility at an earlier time. So before they start the course in that gap between um, leaving the first register provider and starting with the receiving register provider, they may need to provide welfare arrangements in that gap as well, the receiving provider or just don't enrol students under 18, then it's much easier. Standard 7.4. If a release is granted, it must be at no cost to the overseas student and the releasing registered provider must advise the overseas student to contact immigration to seek advice on whether a new student visa is required. Seven point five. If the registered provider intends to refuse the transfer request, they must inf they must inform the overseas student in writing of the reason for the refusal or reasons, the overseas student's right to access the provider's complaints and appeals process in accordance with Standard Ten. Um, so within twenty working days. And 7.6, the registered provider must not finalise the student's refusal, refusal status in prisons until the appeal finds in favour of the registered provider or the OC student has chosen not to access the complaints and appeals process within the 20 working day period or the OC student withdraws from the process. They decide they don't want to transfer after all. So in brief, refusing a release. So if you uh, intend to refuse a release, it must not finalise your, your, the overseas student's um, refusal status in prisons until um, an appeal against the refusal lodged by the overseas student is finalised. So you've followed the appeals part of your complaints and appeals process and upheld the decision. Um, or the OC student did not access your complaints and appeals process within that 20 working day period, or the OC student withdraws their appeal against your refusal. Uh, you must notify the student in writing the reasons for refusing the transfer request. So that would be grounds for a student to appeal if you did not notify why you had refused um, to grant their transfer request. That would be perfectly good grounds for a student to appeal that they were not advised of the reasons for which their request was granted. So again, you must notify the student in writing the reasons for refusing the transfer request and advise the student of their right to submit an appeal within 20 working days. Standard 
Standard 7.7, .7, the registered provider must maintain records of all requests from overseas students for a release and the assessment of and decision regarding the request for two years after the student ceases to be an accepted student. So these are to be recorded within PRISMS. No hard copy release letter is required from the releasing provider. However, the provider should still advise the student of the outcome of the transfer request. This can be done via an email. A formal letter is not required. It is the registered provider's responsibility to ensure that the student understands their rights and responsibilities which includes encouraging the student to consider whether a change in enrollment breaches a visa condition and informing the student of their responsibilities concerning their visa conditions. May include speak to your agent, confirm that this is the right thing for you. And if they're dealing with an education agent, it might be suggesting they speak to a migration agent who has much more experience and is legally able to advise them on their visa requirements. Okay, so that brings us to the end. Next webinar is on the 3rd of May and we will be looking at TAE, so that is RTO clauses 1.22 to 1.25, delivering certificate for or delivering training products from the TAE training package, Man managing transition and teach out, which is standards for RTOs clauses 1.26 to 1.27, and ELICOS courses, which are crack or um, National Code Standards 8.6 to 